On this episode of Resi Week, we talk Apple iOS updates, not getting fired, and Snap One's UI personalization changes. All this and more on this episode of Resi Week. This is Resi Week, episode 450, Descoped. Welcome to this episode of Resi Week. This is your weekly roundup of all the latest news and stories for the residential AV industry. I'm your host, Matt D. Scott for AVNation.TV, and this week I'm pleased to be joined by two of my good friends. First, we have Mr. Paul Williams. He's the managing director of the Home Management Business Unit over at NICE. How are you doing, Paul? Matthew, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show again. Thank you for being here. And then we have the one and only Mr. Jason Knott. He's the, the evangelist over at DTools. How are you doing, Jason? I'm doing great, Matt. Thanks for having me. We, we almost had the trifecta of France, the UK, and Canada. Yeah, we, almost hit almost, a, we almost hit a, almost a wonderful... It you know, kind of Commonwealth-ish uh, effect, but so close. Jason came home early. All right, let's kick this off with a story that comes to us from CE Pro. Apple adds new smart home control features in their latest software release. Uh, if you missed it uh, over the last week or so, Apple released iOS 18, tvOS 18, and iPadOS 18, uh, bringing a whole slew of new functionalities uh, to optimize and enhance the user experience and drive some advanced home automation. Uh, the the TV iOS uh, update has brought some new AI stuff as what they're calling Insight, as well as a slew of other things. There's some better home control that's now available on the iPhone and the iPad. So the question is, you know, what is Apple doing in this space? Paul, I, I wanna start with you on this. We've watched Apple on this show and in this industry, essentially since they brought out the iPhone and the iPad, uh, when they were literally just replacing touch panels uh, from the many ma major manufacturers with iPads to the point where it still seems to be a side project for them, but they do still kind of have a, a, a large footprint in the home automation space. Coming from the company that you're with now, and obviously they have a, a whole slew of solutions, but you also have a you know, kind of DIY-ish. I, like, I don't want to pigeonhole it per se, but they do have a, 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 a consumer avenue. How do you see Apple's advancements in their home space affecting or, or complementing what you are doing? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's interesting, Matt. It, it, as you mentioned, we've watched them through iterations. This is, I think this is reboot number seven or eight, somewhere in there. Something like they that. They just, uh, they keep coming around with different ways of looking at the, uh, at the smart home and at the connected home space. And um, it's interesting because we watch it and I've talked, I've, I've met with them many times in the past. I've met with the new regime that comes in and says, hey, we're serious about smart home and this is what we're doing. And then, you know, three months later, I, none of those people are there anymore because they moved on to other departments and new, new, new faces are then talking to you again about what they're going to do in the smart home, which is different than the previous faces told you about. So, so there, uh, I have a little, I, it's, it, that sounds skeptical and I am um, just because I, I, I don't see the, the definite direction. It just seems to shift a lot, but for the, for our space and the, how we, how we look at it, they are, I'm Apple fanboy number one too. So it's, it pains me to actually even say that, but uh Everything I own is is Apple, and I'll buy I'll buy anything they put their name on. I'll just buy it anyway, just because. Um, it's the for us that I think the critical parts about that are are making sure that we have interoperability. Um, and so as we look at it, we have a new driver that we just released also for Apple TV that uh, is based on the new APIs, and so it should be it's it's going to be a better better solution it's based on their APIs, I should say, which is which is good. Um, a lot in the past, you get some reverse engineering that companies have done to be able to make them work correctly. Now we have a, a, an official API we can work with, so better integration. Uh, we're hopeful that that also means for our integrators that it doesn't get broken because that was what would happen before. You'd have these 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 um, these places where they would change the protocol or something would change and suddenly it was broken and now nobody can work their homes or the it's not functioning correctly. So we're hoping that that gets better with that. But when it comes down to the user interface, um, I I like some of the things that I saw in the new update that they've done. Um, I've looked at it, it came out when I updated my phone, it was there and I started to look at some of the things. I think it's, I think it's nice, I think it's there. But, but the way that we're thinking about that, we still think of, of this world where our consumer isn't looking for multiple interfaces, they're looking for simple interfaces. They don't want it to be 
a hard experience. And if they have to go between our nice home management uh, platform and now between the Apple home platform, it's, it's very confusing for them. Do this over here and then do this over there, but don't do them together or do them separately. Very confusing. So we're trying to keep them in one environment. So from our messaging and how we're handling that, it's still very much we're keeping the same the same methodology, which is we'll control the Apple devices for as, as much and as deeply as they will let us control. But we want them in our environment um, because we think that is the best way to be able to control their experience in a way that our customers have a positive experience. Yeah, that's a really good point. Jason, you've obviously followed this for, for eons um, or a minute, whatever makes you feel more comfortable. <laughs> What is their space? Like, 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 how do they, how does Apple fit in to our world? Are they strictly just a hardware kind of vendor partner, a source device? Are they a platform or are they still, are they trying to figure it out? Yeah, I think Paul hit the nail on the head there that I think that, I think it was about a month or so ago, Matt, you and I were having this conversation on one of the previous broadcasts where we were talking about Logitech pulling back possibly from their surveillance line from HomeKit. And then it turned out the CEO was mistaken on that or something like that. But everybody was kind of up in arms about uh, whether what what is the future of HomeKit in terms of um, home surveillance, or not just home surveillance, but home automation in general. I think Paul's right that, that the customer doesn't care if it's Matter, doesn't care if it's HomeKit. They don't care what is the communication. It's just got to work. And um, I don't know that integrators are really enamored, even though we're an Apple home here too, Paul. My wife is a complete fangirl of yeah. uh, of everything Apple in our household also. But I don't know if that, that relates down to, to integrators. The one thing that I, I did like about this is they talked about, you know, the problem of the iPad going to sleep consistently as, as, as a home control mechanism that now you can kind of lock in some of those icons for the home automation features, which then makes that a little more palatable, I would guess, than having it um, you know, be disappeared and the homeowner seem, seemingly having to start all over on their iPad every single time they wanna turn their lights on or, or um, you know, whatever, turn the TV on, listen to music, et cetera. So, I don't have an answer for you because I don't think they know what they're doing. What I would say, know what they're doing. I don't. I think they're still just kind of nudging their way in to see how much of this, of this market can we take. Is there potential here? Will integrators do? Integrators love us. I don't know, Paul. Do you hear from integrators who are like, "Oh, I, I love Apple. I love Apple. I love Apple." I don't hear that. No, I hear the opposite because they break things a lot, and that's the that's the other part of the story, right? So I think there's a difference between loving Apple, as both of you alluded to as an Apple fanboy or fangirl or fan whatever versus loving it in the work environment, right? right. I, I was working with a, a church this weekend and their technical director was talking about how he hates Apple in their environment. He uses it himself personally, but as a production product, he dislikes it greatly. And I, I think there needs to be a separation between that every time we look at Apple or talk about Apple, there is a difference. I love the iPad as an interface. Um, I don't love it as a dedicated interface for the reasons you both mentioned. It's a, it, I think it requires that separation. All right, let's change topics for a second. This comes to us from residential systems. You don't get fired. You just don't get asked to do the next thing. Uh, this comes to us from a good friend of the show, Mr. Henry Clifford. Uh, Henry talks about, he, he starts off with an example of a industry musician who had played for years and gigged until one day his phone stopped ringing and he found out that the band and the groups that he used to gig with have moved on and replaced him with someone else. Um, and then Henry alludes to the story uh, uh, with another example of one of their builders that they used to do a lot of work with and subsequently moved on and, and started working with a competitor. And they looked into, you know, what happened to that relationship? Did it just not fit? Did it did it evolve? Uh, did we mess something up, et cetera, et cetera? And you know what the process is to not only determine what the problem was, uh, but also looking at whether they want to get reinvolved in that. Jason, let me start with you on this. Uh, Henry raises a really good point that the best customer we all have 
is the customer we already have that we just haven't reached out to in a long time. At the same time, there are typically reasons why longtime customers stop being customers. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's bad. How do you go about trying to evaluate those relationships and also maintain the ones you want to maintain? Well, obviously, one of the big pushes we're seeing is service agreements. You know, the integrators signing service agreements with the customers. So, so it's not just a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. I hope you never call me again. Um, I, your system's working, but I don't want to hear from you again. I like the integrators forging long-term relationships with their customers. If you guys know, I came from the security side where that is the staple. Um, you build customers for long-term value. But the one element that's always been missing from this is integrators don't have mechanisms in place to be able to have those continuing uh, engagement points with, with customers. The ones who do are, I think, going to do better. So this, this whole market is built on, you know, word of mouth referrals for new customers, but then you want to get upgrades from your existing customers. Um, we had some interesting data from DTools Cloud recently that for the first six, six months of the year to just kind of show you how important it is, as you said, that Im the importance of maintaining the relationship with that new customer. So for the first six months of the year for, in Details Cloud, and this is out of uh, 85,000 some odd proposals that were run through Details Cloud in the first six months of the year, dealers had a 52% close rate. So that means just over half of the proposals that integrators are producing they are getting the signed contract. Now let's take it a step further. When you look at the signed contracts, the value engineering that is taking place in the signed contract is only 49% of what was in, of the value that was in the proposal is ending up in the signed contract. So now let's just kind of do the math of how hard an integrator has to work to be able to produce a volume. He has to be able to produce um, proposals at an efficient level that are very targeted in order to maximize what's getting value engineered out or de-scoped is the kind of the new hip term that people talk about out of it. So my point being that, you know, when Henry talks about, and you talk about Matt having that recurring customer, that is really, really important because look at what you have to, look at what you're fighting against in order to get, maintain that new customer from the data that I just produced. Yeah, that's a great point. Paul, when you see this, I, I often wonder if those clients that are kind of getting left behind, if they're not always the ones you kind of want to leave behind. Yeah, I, I, we see that. I mean, there are some customers that you, you uh, don't want to have a long-term relationship with. You find that out after you're in the relationship. But I, even though, even then, I still think that there's there's such a value to to maintaining those relationships. I mean, what you also don't want is even though that customer may have been difficult, you also don't want them spewing sulfur dioxide in the environment either, because it is word of mouth. And and our customer base, they they hang around the same group of customers that are the ones that you're going to need for referral at some point in the future. And what you don't want is, oh yeah, I I had those guys. They came over and then they never never called again. I never heard from them ever again. My system's broken. I can't get in touch with them. They don't answer the phone. They're not answering email. Don't ever go over there, right? And now I've got this person that's spewing that out into the into the ether, and that that is not good for your business because it is this business exists on word of mouth, and I need all those folks to at least if they're not going to say something good about me, they be, I don't want them to say anything bad about me. If they're not going to say anything at all. I'd rather have them not say anything at all. And so I think it's really important uh, to be able to do that. And Jason hit hit one of the key points, which is get a service contract. That's going to allow you at least a touch point that you can call in every once in a while and go, hey, you know what? I'm I'm going to come check out your system. We're gonna we're gonna update it. We're gonna get it up the latest greatest firmware. We're gonna make sure all your access points are updated. We're gonna make sure your network's working. We're gonna do a system check. We're gonna make sure everything's running the way it should. And if if you do that, that is also that perfect time for the upsell because all the manufacturers, us included. Come out with new products and I go, hey, did you know that, hey, this company has this brand new product or this brand new interface? We saw some of that news just recently as well. How would you like me to update that? And I can put that into your system. Um, and, you know, and it will cost you X and I can do that. And I'm going to give you a special deal on it because I'm here in the house. And those are the kind of things you can do when you do that. But I think the, the critical part there is is to keep in touch with these people. Um, 
it, it, even if it's not even about that that particular solution, they want you to be their technology champion, their your tech, their technology guru. And if, even if you reach out, you reach out and go, you know what, there was this thing that happened and and we needed to check on your network security because there's something that we've seen happen out there with people's information getting stolen. We want to do a checkup just to make sure you're safe. That for me as a customer goes a long way. I go, wow, this these people really have my interest in it. It may have nothing to do with the, uh, the solution they put in, but they want to help me stay um, safe and secure. Those are the kind of things I'm going to remember later because once again, even if they don't buy from me, I need them to be a referral for me in the future. I need them to talk to I need them to talk to their friends and tell what a great experience they had with me and so that I can now get my future business from there. Otherwise, all I'm doing is I'm getting ones and dones. My my job becomes so hard. I have to go out there and try to cultivate new leads when the leads will come to me if I do the right job with keeping these customers happy. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, gentlemen, let's move on to our next story of the day. This comes to us from Residential Tech Today. Snap One enhances personality personalization with Control 4 X4 UI. It is a completely new and redesigned and reimagined user interface uh, that evolved from the ground up, allowing customers and users, if you will, uh, a whole lot more dedicated control and ability to design things for their home effectively. Paul, let me, let me start with you on this. There is been a massive push the last couple of years into consumer facing control, right? We've always had obviously controls for the consumer, but we're giving them personalization. We're letting, or, or the, the manufacturers are allowing the end users to control things and design, you know, scenes and, and settings and, and changing all of those things that, you know, definitely when I started, that was always an integrator call. You had to call someone. We continue to see a bigger push and more announcements coming out from all the manufacturers pushing that end user control. Have we have we reached a maximum of that yet? Or is there still room to grow? Yeah, there's still room to grow. In fact, I mean, we, we announced at CD as well, we have personalization that can be based on facial recognition at the touchscreen the different user can have in the home can have their own view show up, their own interface that show up and completely customized by the integrator to have each person in the home have their own view. Uh, kids only see what the kids need to see. You can restrict their access so they're not getting cameras and thermostats and all the stuff you don't want them to see. But uh, you and your and whoever else is in the house that you trust with that can get everything that they want. And so and also their favorites, the things they want to see. And I think we're going to continue to see that because that personalized part of that experience is also what makes these systems powerful. And that's that's why you know I applaud what, what Snap's doing and what we're doing because the consumer, once again, wants it to be simple. And if every time I have to get in to watch or to listen to my favorite music, I'm four keystrokes deep into it, it just gets frustrating after a while. I'm like, I just want to play my, I, Jason was just doing the Beatles walk across Isai Abbey Road, so I'm walking across it. I want him to play Beatles and to get to play the Beatles, I've got to go like through four screens do a search, put, type in Beatles. It's too complicated. But if I had a single button, it's on the front screen all the time because I know that's what I use every single day. I press one button, I'm happy, right? But not everybody in the house wants that. Not everybody in the house likes the Beatles or wants to listen to that right now. And having that personalized experience is a thing that really allows our, the consumer to be enamored with what you've got. It, it makes it more powerful for them because they're getting what they want out of it. Not mm -hmm. just a generic, here's my generic screen view of the world. Jason, is this what's going to drive an increase in automation sales because for for quite a long time we we've been seeing that decrease right more or, or sorry less and less automation systems are being sold we're able to do more from you know the generic tv that you go get at, at best buy or costco is the personalization going to be the next wave of automation advancements and automation sales in the home it could be, but I think the bigger point, this ties back to what we, the previous topic that we talked about with Henry, that is the, the, the relief that this gives the integration community on the service side. So um, I hear anecdotally from so many integrators that like, eh, I don't do service contracts. We just talked about how important it is to do service contracts. We have so many of them saying, I don't do it because I don't have the manpower. I do not have the ability to service all this, all these legacy systems that I have out there. 
And when you talk to a lot of integrators, for they always point back to the control system as the reason they have so many service calls. Um, so the adding more consumer features like this, consumer tweaks, the ability for them to do these post-installation changes, I think reduces, as you say, Matt, they don't have to call you to come out there to do it. When you don't have somebody available to do it, I think it's it's hugely beneficial to the integration community. I'm, I applaud what Elon Nice is doing. I applaud what Snap One is doing here with Control 4. And to your point, Matt, I then, you know, looking at this subject, I looked at the DTools data for the first half of this year and then actually compared it against what we've seen over the last couple of years in terms of controls. And I'm not talking about voice control in, at all. That is was not in the data that I had I pulled. This was just traditional, um, you know, electronic control. But integrators are reducing the amount of proposals in which they offer um, control systems. Uh, it's flat out. It's it's there now. Why would they be doing that if customers are demanding it? Customers want it. The re the to me the reason they're doing it is because they re they don't want to service it, or they can't service it. So we saw in contracts um, from 2022, again, about a 20% decline in terms of the percentage of contracts that have a control solution in them over the last three years. So um, it's a definite trend. It's a distinctive trend. Um, the percentage of contracts is not really important because it's very, it's a very low number anyway, because most contracts don't need a control solution. You know, you're putting a hang and bang TV in, you don't need, there's not a control solution there. So mo the, the great majority of contracts are never going to be something that have a control solution in them anyway. But um, the point being that there is a definite con um, um, trend of integrators offering less control. I applaud these moves because I do believe this is going to hopefully spur integrators to not shy away from offering control solutions because it will be less of a burden on their service departments. Do either of you think that customers have don't don't have a great understanding of what the control system can actually do for them? 100%. It's been it's been the biggest problem has been educating the consumer about the art of the possible. And it's been there since since I've been involved for over two decades now in the smart in the smart and connected space, and and they don't know what it is. The other part of the thing goes along with this is going to echo a little bit of Jason. We hear from integrators as well, is is that a lot of times the consumer actually doesn't get the ex full experience because the dealers have learned. So if I put a button and I program the button on the wall to have the lights turn on at thirty percent and it start to play that Beatles playlist. I can guarantee next week they're going to call me and go, I want the lights at 40% and now I want it to be Nirvana. And, and I don't have time to tweak the button every week that you want to make a change. If I don't tell you it can do it, you never bug me about it. So, But the customer never gets the value out of understanding this, get the value out of what their investment is really. And that's really the magic of the system is all these things you can do and it can be automated in ways that, that, that they, the dealer can do. But they don't do it. In fact, um, into that data, now that I, I've worked for three companies um, in this space, um, it I've had that same view of being able to look and see what's going on in programming throughout the world. It, it will, it might shock, maybe not, it might shock you how very little real programming is being done in these control systems. They are just indeed that, just control. There's very yeah. little like complex programming. And it's because, as we talk to dealers, once again, I know if I make it complex, First of all, they're going to get confused if I make these. We've also seen that dealers will confuse it. And then it's like four button presses does this, three button presses does this. And the consumer doesn't realize they press it four times and things are happening and they're wondering why their home's out of control. And now they're mad. I don't. If I don't do that, they, know, they don't get mad. And if I don't show them these things that they're going to want to tweak later, they don't bug me. And they're still happy because it controls everything they want to control. But the consumer doesn't ever get that full benefit. Is there a balance to that? Because I agree with you. I have gone into way too many projects, both residential and commercial, where I wanted to grab the previous integrator by the neck and tell them just because you can doesn't mean you should. Absolutely. And then on the flip side, I've gone into projects where the customer didn't realize that they could, you know, change their shades the time their shades went down. 
They literally had been living with what had been programmed poorly, I might add, four years previous. That's the part that alarms me is that we're seeing fewer, we're seeing less and less of it in proposals. Yeah. So let the customer decide, you know, get it out there and show them the difference between an integrated solution and a, and a, and a multi-system solution, but at least let them see what is possible. But we're seeing the same, not at quite the same speed, but we're seeing fewer proposals with control in it, just like we're seeing fewer contracts. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, gentlemen, let's leave it there. Thank you both so much for joining us. Jason, if people want to connect with you, learn more about DTools, where can they do that? They can go to d-tools.com. They can follow me on Twitter at Jason W. Knott. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Mr. Williams, if people want to connect with you, learn more about Nice and their family of products, where can they do that? They can go to nice for you, all spelled out, uh, niceforyou.com. It'll tell you everything that we're doing and got going on. I'm available on all the socials. So if you just search for Paul Williams and nice, you usually find me from there. So Excellent. Thank you again for joining us. If you'd like to connect with me, you can find me on Twitter or X at Matt D. Scott and pretty much every other social platform. But more importantly, please visit avnation.tv where you'll find this show as well as a wide variety of other shows with all the verticals that we cover. When you visit the website, please take a moment to check out our supporters. We are extremely thankful for their support and ask that you check them out as well. Thanks again for watching. That's all the time we have for this episode of Resi Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. This is AV Nation.